I want to start this video by saying that this case is about children being murdered and it is it's pretty graphic. So I just wanted to give you the option of not watching this video if you know you just you don't want to hear a story like this. Hello true crimeers, this is the case of the Otaku killer. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. <laughs> Satomu Miyazaki was born in 1962, and he was born in Tokyo, Japan. Now, the woman that raised him as the, his mother was not actually his biological mother. That is because his biological mother was his sister. He was a product of incest. He was born with a, a rare defect uh, where in his wrists, he actually could not bend his wrists all the way. And that would later go on to create a lot of issues, especially when he was younger in school, kids would bully him. And so that caused him to essentially alienate himself. His family was very wealthy. They actually owned at that time a successful newspaper, which is no longer in business. They were a very well-known prominent-ish family there in that part of Tokyo. Satomu was not really close with pretty much most of his family. He, I guess you can say he was kind of like the black sheep of the family. However, he was really close with his grandfather. When his grandfather died, Satomu, he ate some of his grandfather's ashes so that he could be, he could remain close with his grandfather. That's what he, his thinking was. Now, while he essentially was ostracized in school, he at first as a child did really well in school, in elementary school and whatnot, but as the school years went by, as the torment and the bullying kind of got worse, he began to get worse at school. He was supposed to take over the family business, the newspaper business when he was older, but he said he had absolutely no desire to do that. When he got to college, he became very much a problem. He had been taking photography classes and he had been caught taking photos of some of the female high school athletes crotches which would lead him into the world of looking for pornography which then unfortunately turned to looking for child uh, pornography it really appeared that this all stemmed from the death of his grandfather you know how he had eaten his ashes some of his ashes and his behavior, his mental behavior began to deteriorate from then. But it's not really known if he always had the psychological stuff going on inside of him that would lead him to do what he eventually would do, or if this branched off from the death of his grandfather. It was August of 1988. A four-year-old girl named Mari Kono was abducted. A few weeks after she was abducted, her family had already reported her missing pretty much the day of, but a few weeks after she was abducted, her parents received a box in the mail. In that box was a photo of the outfit that Mari Kono was wearing the day she was taken. There was also uh, several very small teeth inside this box with fine powder. And then there was a, a postcard with these words on it. Mari cremated bones investigate prove. Once the story was all over the news, the family would start to get phone calls of somebody just breathing into the phone. It was quite disturbing because it was all around the same time that the, the box of items had been sent to them. So as it turns out, Satomu Miyazaki was the one to have kidnapped Mari. He forced her into his car and then they, he drove off with her. Nobody witnessed the abduction. He drove to an area a little west of Tokyo, uh, kind of a de desolate area. He parked his car under the bridge or under a bridge nearby. And then he murdered the four-year-old girl. And after she was dead, he took off her clothes and he sexually assaulted her corpse. He then just dumped her body in the woods. And over the next couple of weeks, as he sent it, calling the family and sending this box of items to them, he goes back to the corpse every once in a while to check on it. And then one of the times he went back to it, he took off 
her hands and her feet, and he brought them back to his home. In October of 1988, it happened again. A seven-year-old girl named Masami Yoshizawa was abducted. Satomu had abducted her, forced her into his car, and drove off with her. Again, nobody witnessed this. He drove the little girl to a secluded place in the woods, much like he did with Mari. He killed her, took her clothes off, and then sexually assaulted her corpse. He left her body to rot in the woods, and he took the clothes she was wearing back to his home. So they, the press in the area began to label this guy as the otaku killer because they didn't know who he was at first, obviously. And this created a panic in this, in this entire area. People were afraid for their children, for their daughters, because they don't know if this is going to happen again. Over the next several months, it does happen to two more girls. Four-year-old Erica Namba, she was walking alone on the side of the road, I don't know why, um, and she was abducted. Nobody saw it happen. Why a four-year-old girl was on her own, again, I have no idea. Sutomu had abducted her. He then killed her, took off her clothes, and sexually assaulted her. And then for some reason, he tied her up after she was dead and then just dumped her body in a parking lot nearby. Erica's family also received a, a similar box that Mari's family had received. Her family got a note that said these words, Erica, cold cough, throat, rest, death. And then the fourth victim, five-year-old Ayako Nomoto. She was abducted in June of 1989 when Sutomu had said, hey, can I take some photos of you? This time, instead of just killing her in his car and doing what he normally did, this time he brought her to his home. He killed her and had her corpse just in his apartment. He would spend the next couple of days repeatedly sexually assaulting the five-year-old girl's corpse. He photographed her corpse. He took videos of what he was doing to her, and he pleasured himself to his cor her corpse. He dismembered her, and he ate some of her organs, or bit into some of his, her organs, and he, he drank her blood. And I guess he also chewed on her hands and her feet. As her body decomposed, he then just cut her up and began to dispose her body parts in various places for people to find. But then he got nervous. He said, I, maybe I don't want them to be found. And so he collected them and brought them back to his home, her body parts. The police then, they get a note, um, a confession note in the mail, and it reads, quote, Before I knew it, the child's corpse had gone rigid. I wanted to cross her hands over her breasts, but they wouldn't budge. Pretty soon, the body gets red spots all over it. Big red spots. Like the Hinomaru flag, after a while, the body is covered with stretch marks. It was so rigid before, but now it feels like it's full of water. And it smells. How it smells. Like nothing you've ever smelled in this whole wide world. End quote. And this was sent to one of the victim's families, but they still didn't know who wrote it. But then in July of 1989, all of the horror would finally come to an end. Sutomu so had found two girls, sisters, playing together. He approached them and he managed to separate the two of them. And then he began to drag one of the sisters to his car. The other sister ran into the house and got their father. The father runs out of the house. He sees a man in a car with his daughter. The man is taking photos of his daughter. The father then uh, basically violently takes the, the man out of the car and begins to attack him, which allows his other daughter to get out of the vehicle. Sotomu had then managed to escape the clutches of the father and he ran. Police were called and they basically were waiting for this, whoever this guy was, Sotomu, to come back to his car because he left it there. And the guy, stupidly, he did. He came back to get his car, and the police were hiding and waiting for him. So once he came back, he was arrested. They searched his car, and they searched his home, and they found just so much disturbing evidence. There were 5,000, over 5,000 videotapes of pornography, child pornography, of anime, slasher movies, videos of himself abusing the corpses of his victims. They found photos of some of the murder victims dismembered in his home. And they also found the body of that fourth victim, her body parts, in his house. He seemed to not care. 
He was completely just calm about it, and he had no reactions to being caught. He had no remorse. He showed no signs of ever wanting to apologize or say sorry or anything. He just did not seem to care that he was caught, and he didn't seem to care about what he did. When they asked him why did he do this, he said he didn't do it. He said it was the rat man who did it. The rat man was someone he said lived inside of him. A psychologist would determine that it was really his disconnect from his family and his strong bond with his grandfather that started this path of where he ended up. And they determined that based on stuff found in his apartments, he had really turned to the world of anime, of manga, slasher films, which all gave him like comfort. He was very, very, very obsessed with all of this. And I guess that's where they got the term the otaku killer from based on his obsession with anime, which caused many people to go, hey, whoa, a lot of people love anime. A lot of people are obsessed with anime, but like, they don't go and murder people because of it. So there was a lot of that, like, that's unfair that you're putting this. It's just like what we do here when there's a mass shooting, right? And we say, oh, it's movies that do this. It's video games. It's it's bad music that that causes these things to happen. It sounds like it's very similar to that. But the truth of the matter is, it's, it's the person who did it. The person committed these crimes. This person should have been helped at some point, but nobody noticed that he needed help. His trial, I don't understand why, but it lasted seven years. Seven years. And he was eventually found guilty of all of the murders, along with other crimes. And he was initially sentenced to death. They tried to appeal it and say he had such a broken mind. He was psychologically damaged. He had a feeble mind. And it would be essentially unfair or unjust to execute him. But they also determined that he was well aware of what he was doing. He did these things deliberately. He chose to do them. He knew that it was wrong, but he continued to do it anyway. He knew to go back and collect body parts in terms of so they're not found. He was, and he sent stuff to the families. He called the families. He knew very much what he was doing. This, he was psychologically unwell, obviously, but that's not, he still chose as a functioning person to do what he did. And so the courts rejected his appeals. In 2008, along with two other death row inmates there, he was executed. And it was done so by hanging. And with that hanging, the four child victims that he brutalized, that he raped, murdered, took photos of, dismembered, that he just absolutely brutalized, they got the justice they rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, Maroonie, Doody, Dingle, Mary Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, please subscribe if you're into true crime. Give this video a like. I tell many true crime stories every week. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. I'm talking fast. My battery's blinking at me. Um, so feel free to join me or follow me over on TikTok. The, the links are linked in the description in the link tree below. The links also pop up here in the corner. I also sell merch. The merch store is listed in the link tree below. If there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below. The name of the person, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add that case to my list. I pick my cases at random, so I can't promise you I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. It's orange now. Okay, so until the next case, uh, ta-ta for now. True crime, Arunis. All right, goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye.